Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. So we're starting a new series this week. It's uh, last week we did, or last month we completed our um, How To Spirituality series. And this month we're going to do the Keys to Financial Freedom. We're going to dive deep into our tradition of spiritual teaching around our finances. It's something that we have been doing since the very beginning of the New Thought Movement. And I am one of the, um, I'll say I'm a poster boy for how this stuff works, that my money was messed up when I got here. And I learned by practice and application of spiritual principles in the realm of my finances to turn it around and recognize that money is just energy. And it's neutral in itself, but I could work with it in a conscious, positive, and coherent way. And it's been incredible. So that's what we're about all month. Uh, Reverend Jim, next week, will be sharing um, how we can experience prosperity in community. And today I'm talking about this. We are meant to thrive. Young mom was getting her son ready for school, preschool, actually. She said, hurry up, we gotta go, we gotta go. He comes out and she says, buddy, your shoes are on the wrong feet. And he looks up at her and he says, these are the only feet I got. <laughs> I've told that one before, but it really illustrates the way I'd like to start this talk today. That some of us are having the experiences around our lives where we feel it don't fit. It doesn't work for me. Reminds me of a, a years ago, I was at the Big Sky Retreat in Montana, and I don't remember who was speaking or what the topic was, but we were broken up into groups of two to do some processing. And my partner in the process was the amazing Mary Manna Morrissey. And I don't remember, like I said, what the topic was, but I was single at the time, and I was working with my desire to create partnership in my life. But what I heard myself tell Mary was, maybe I'm just not meant to have that this, in this lifetime. And she looked at me and smiled, maybe in a little bit of a motherly way, maybe like a mother looking at a child with its feet on shoes on the wrong feet, and she said, Michael God, you're a son of God. You can have anything you want. Whew, it was like a transmission. But I've been walking around with my shoes on the wrong feet. I had been thinking that, this, that I'm a victim here of the way that my life is. And what Mary was reminding me was, no, you're just seeing it wrong. See, life presents possibility to us. Life presents abundance to us, but sometimes we're not getting it. That we have wrong ideas and wrong ways of being and doing in relationship to what is. And so this whole month, I'm going to ask you to maybe use that metaphor. That maybe you've got all you need, but you just got them on the wrong feet. And maybe there's a new way that we can begin to interact with life and experience financial freedom. And you know, the truth is, most people are not looking for giant sums of money. What we're really looking for is freedom. That if I want to take a trip, I take a trip. If I want a new suit, I buy a new suit. If I want a new car, I get a new car, right? That's We want the freedom to live our lives in the way that supports our best selves. And I'm here to tell you that's the way it's designed. So here are the three things I want to share today. Since I'm talking about financial, um, the keys to financial freedom, the, these want to be a little bit of a continuation of last month. This is how to, how it works, how we can take these principles in our hands. Here are the three things I want to share. The first is that in order to change your relationship with money, with the financial energy, you have to change your thinking about it. The, sex, the second thing I want to talk about is that giving and receiving is a way of being. They are not two things, it's one thing. I'm going to talk about that. And then the last thing I want to talk about is that repetition strengthens and confirms our desire for change. I'm going to start with uh, the master teacher, Jesus of Nazareth. 
This is from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, what you will wear. It's not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds in the air. They do not sow nor reap nor store away in barns, and yet their heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed such as these. And if this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more take care of you, you of little faith? So don't worry, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But first, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. Do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. That passage, those eight verses there, are what we know as the Sermon of the Mount, and all the historians and the, the scholars who have really studied Jesus say that this man did actually exist. He was a, a spiritual teacher in the Middle East, and of all the sayings attributed to Jesus of Nazareth, this collection, these couple of chapters here in Matthew and Luke, they are considered to be most likely. There is a, there's a consistency in the character of the teaching and what I read in these, these scriptures particularly is that there is a non-duality that ran in the work of Jesus. There is an understanding of oneness, of connection. He would say that the king, why do you say the kingdom of heaven is here or there? It's within. We are already connected to this infinite good that is God. And so he's trying to show us here, we worry about conditions. We spend so much energy out in the world trying to get, I think if I can just get enough food, if I can just get the right suit, I'll be good. And, and what Jesus is telling us, like, no, you got it backwards. Start with the kingdom that is already within you, and it's all going to be okay. Recently, I shared with you from Michael Singer that he says the whole point of spirituality is just to get to, I'm okay. That's it. That's the whole point. I'm okay. So if we start with, I'm okay, then what we need will come to us easily because we're not after it. You know, oh, what's her name? Florence Govell Shin. Not in my notes, but I want to share this with you. She's a wonderful New Thought writer in the 1910s. She had these little great pithy little sayings. And yes, I said pithy. She would say this one. I love it. My ship comes in on a sea of don't care. <laughs> you see, sometimes when we're chasing after the stuff, we have created an energetic block to receiving our good. But if we seek first the kingdom of God, See, and what I mean by that, it's not about being holier than thou. It's not about following the rules of some religion that people made up. What I'm talking about is getting in alignment with the true spiritual nature of God and reality that you are. Start living that. Start living from that love and non-condemnation. Start living from this awareness that it's all connected. And start living with this awareness that there is a flow of divine good that is always around you and it is seeking you. Living from that, then we simply welcome our good. Michael Beckwith says, we did not come here to survive. We are here to master the overflow. And I love that phrase because overflow implies that you can't hoard it. You can't contain the good of God. It's going to flow. This morning, early, I was watching a video interview with Bob Proctor, who was Mary Morrissey's uh, mentor and teacher. And he talked about this idea that, and he, he was a wealthy man. Before he ever discovered these principles of, of the law of attraction, he had no money. As a matter of fact, in the 1960s, he made $4,000 a year and owed 6000 So that's where he started off. 
And he had borrowed money from everybody that he could borrow from. But somebody said, I've got a, a, something that will work for you, but you're going to need about $1,000. And Bob said he had already worn out every welcome, anyone he could think of that would loan him $1,000, but he was not going to give up. And he found somebody who took a chance on him. And for $980, he bought a floor, piece of floor cleaning equipment, buckets and mops, and started cleaning floors in office buildings. Within five years, he had a multi-million dollar company in the 1960s. And he didn't know how he did it. But then he got curious about how he did it. And he began to work with the principals and studied. He studied with Earl Nightingale. He studied at Napoleon Hill. He began to find these teachers who would explain these principles that are at work. That if we get in alignment, which is what Jesus was saying, seek first the kingdom of God. Get in alignment with spiritual reality, and it's going to come. And we can begin to get our shoes on the right feet and get the feet on the right path and begin to change the way we think about it. How many here have experienced difficulty with money? It's okay. I have too. There was a period in my life it was the most difficult and painful part of my life. And then I took one class, and it all changed forever, and I never had a problem again. <laughs> no. I came into this teaching 30 years ago and immediately started working on my money. As a matter of fact, my first affirmative prayer was for a better-paying gig. I was playing and singing at Bill's Hideaway Club, and I received an invitation to come work at the mansion on Turtle Creek in Dallas, Texas. And I was like, wow, this stuff works. But it was just the beginning of my process of unwinding my old limited thinking, my old limited identity of who I thought I was, and opening to something else. Changing my thinking around financial freedom has taken me three decades so far. But I will tell you, I have demonstrated it again and again. And what used to be the most painful area of my life is now really the easiest. It moves I know that it comes and it goes. Like um, That's the reason I want to talk about Bob Proctor. He said, I don't own anything. It's all just energy. But I welcome it as it comes to me, and I give it freely. And that's the segue to the second key to financial freedom is to understand that it's giving and receiving. I used to think those were opposites. Like I either give something or I get something. Now I've come to understand, I've changed my thinking, and I know that it's two sides of an indivisible whole. It's the way we are in the world. I use this metaphor of the, the clenched fist. I can neither give nor receive with a clenched fist. But if I open my hand, I can give what is mine. And look, I'm already prepared. I've created a space to receive the good that is mine now. So we do teach tithing in this church, not because the church needs your money, because the truth is God is our source, but we do need channels, and we know that many of you have committed to giving not only some, but a significant percentage. I'm one of those, but I do it not because it's a rule, not because I'm trying to do the good thing or get an extra star on my crown in heaven. I do it because I've understood the principle. I want to be a generous being. I want to give. I want to put my money where my mouth is. I want to put my money where my faith is. And so I tithe to demonstrate to myself that I believe and I work with this principle of giving and receiving. And guess what? When you're giving 10% of everything you make, you have to rely on your faith. And it moves you into a whole new situation where it's now, oh, you know, I don't know how God's going to do this, but God's going to do this. And guess what? God does it. It begins to just move in much easier ways. I think I shared last week, I don't know if I did or not, but I had, uh, had not received those unexpected mailbox money because people don't do mail that much anymore, but I would receive sometimes orders for CDs and things. And, and I came home from a trip, and there was a $500 Venmo and a $900 check in my mailbox. And I wasn't even surprised. There was one time in my life when I was really just beginning to get it, but I had been tithing a couple of years, and I began to see those little miracles show up. And in one day, I got two checks in the mail. 
One was for $175 and one was for $8,000. Completely unexpected. And here's the thing, they felt the same. They felt the same. There was the same sense of blessing. There's no big or small in God. I just, well, there it is. It wasn't like, oh my God, you're not going to believe what happened to me. It was like, there it is. Now, sometimes I still go, oh my God, you're not going to believe what happened to me. But more and more, my response to these blessings showing up in my life in the realm of finance is like, there it is. This is how I live. I give and I receive with generosity. Eric Butterworth says this. If you don't know Eric Butterworth, get hip to Eric Butterworth. Man, unity minister um, through the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and 80s, right on up to the 90s, but in the 70s, he wrote some really great books, and one is called Spiritual Economics. Pick it up. We've got it in the bookstore. He talks about the difference between receivers and takers. The takers are the people who believe that their lives will always be the total of what they can get from this world. They're always thinking, get, get, get. They plan and scheme ways to get what they want in money, in love, in happiness, in all kinds of good. But no, water, no matter that they may be applying metaphysical techniques, they may still very well be takers. But whatever there may be, their spiritual ideals or lack of, no matter what they take, they can never know peace or security or fulfillment. The givers, on the other hand, are convinced that life is a giving process. Thus, their subtle motivation in all ways is to give themselves away in love, in service, in all the many helpful ways they can invest themselves. They are always secure, for they intuitively know that good flows from within. God is the divine givingness of the universe. Can you say that with me? God is the divine givingness of the universe. And you are created in the image likeness of this divine givingness. You cannot make sense out of life or realize the free flow of substance in your experience until you begin to see yourself as a giver. Strong teaching, I recognize. And I know, I know that feeling when money is scarce. And you go to church and you're hoping for inspiration. The preacher tells you you need to give. Oh, I know that feeling. Awkward. Painful. I'll just say this. Try it and see. Try it and see. We're not going to give a money back guarantee. But try it (laughs) and see. You will. You will receive what you need. And it may not be 10%. Start at 1%. Start at 2%. We have a wonderful program going this month called the Unexpected Income Income Club where we made it really easy. I think we're probably still going to accept people signing up today. I'm just making it. We will. I'm going to say it. I get, I, I get to say some things like that. I'm the boss now. I can say that. <laughs> but all we're going to commit to is for the month of August, we're just going to give 10% of the money we didn't expect. If we get those checks in the mail, if somebody buys us a hamburger at lunch, we're going to give 10% of that. And just begin to play with the energy. This is not meant to be heavy. This is not meant to be onerous. This is meant to be (sighs) flowing, life-affirming, loving, joyful energy of God. That's the way giving and receiving is meant to feel in our lives. And I invite you to begin to take up that key to financial freedom. And lastly... Thinking back again to our our series last month on how-to spirituality, I love that we are a practical teaching. I love that I was given some things I could do when I walked in here, that I could begin to, I was taught how to meditate. We had an incredible meditation day retreat yesterday. Any of you were here yesterday or here today? A few of you are here. It was great. What an amazing experience we had where we practiced together. Practice, practical it's not just depending upon your inspiration, your inspired moments. Those are the only times you get to connect to God. No, you get to just do it. I love that Nike logo or that, I mean, there's that motto, whatever they call that, slogan. Just do it. Whether you feel like sitting in the meditation chair or not, just do it. Whether you feel like praying for that so-and-so, just do it. And we begin to step into it. 
I don't know about any of you, and Debbie, I keep looking at you, I don't know why, you're my inspiration today because you and I have had conversations about this. <laughs> and she's sinking down in the chair now, see how she is. She is a beautiful exemplar of someone who stays the course, who continues just to show up. And we've talked about this. That it, the journey may be difficult at times, but just don't quit. Just keep on, just keep doing it. And watch what will happen. There is a saying in, a, and that's where I, I named this point. From a, it's a phrase from the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous: "Repetition strengthens and confirms." Reading the same books over and over again. I have one book by Ernest Holmes and Raymond Charles Barker that I have read about 22 times. It's a daily inspirational guide, and almost every morning I'm reading. Today is August 6th. I read it this morning. And it's just truth that I just begin to repetition, strengthening and, strengthening and confirming my consciousness. So we need small practices that we can repeatedly do to continue not only to raise our consciousness, but to show our own commitment to our own being. You don't have to show it to anybody else. It's just you. And if you just begin to find those small, simple things you can do every day to show yourself you mean it this time. I'm not only going to say I'm a person who lives a spiritual life, but I'm doing spiritual practice. I shared yesterday with the group on, when we were talking about meditation that other than getting sober, nothing has changed my experience of life more than the practice of meditation. It is incredible, and it took time and practice and really messing up sometimes, really not doing, just not being consistent enough. I was like, I've got to get back to it. Don't give up. I remember one time I was um, on a fitness uh, commitment period, and I was at the gym, and I had been, uh, I think it was soon after I got sober, actually. I was on the elliptical, and I'm just moving and moving and moving. I was going to do 30 minutes of, you know, cardio, and, and I overheard the voice in my head saying, you're doing great, Michael. You're doing great. And it struck me that that was the first time I'd ever heard that voice in my entire life. In my entire life. The voice that I usually heard really there was, who do you think you are? You've really messed up this time. That internalized, critical voice that I had listened to for so long, there was somebody else there now. And that came from practice. Enough, enough, enough repetition, and the voice changed. Doesn't mean that my inner critic was gone forever. It still shows up sometime, but that inner champion, that inner guide, he's there a lot. I listen to him a lot now. Back to Bob Proctor on this topic of three simple things. He was telling a, um, a story of that he was working with his business partner, and she was going through a really, really tough thing. And he, she, before they were finishing a conference, she said, I just need to have coffee with you. And they had coffee across the street from the conference center, and then she said, I need you to tell me two or three things that I can do. So just, I'm not feeling it. I need you to give me two or three things I can do. He said, I can do that. He said, he had, I had no idea what I was going to tell her. But I knew I could come up with two or three things. So these are the three things that Bob Proctor told his business partner that she should do every day. Get a pen and write down 10 things that you're grateful for. And you've got to really be grateful for them. And if you're in a tough space, that may take you a little bit of time. You may have to do some soul searching. My first teacher in New Thought was Reverend Claudia Franklin, and she told me about the beginning of her journey. She said there was one point that the only things that I was okay with in the entire world were my poodle floozy and my African violet. <laughs> that was it. That was all that she could hold in the circle of okayness. And with her practice, that circle grew. Find 10 things you can be grateful for. Second, send love to three people that are really bothering you. I was thinking of a certain politician. <laughs> and I practiced this this morning, moving out of the need for vengeance, just sending love. I can see the brokenness and the, the disconnect there, and I could just send love. 
doesn't mean that I don't want the law to be served fully. <laughs> but I don't, have to, I don't have to be the judge and jury. I can just send love. Three people. And lastly, spend five minutes in the quiet and ask for direction for the day. Those three things that Bob Proctor made up in the moment when his partner asked him became the three daily practices for everyone in his organization. For years now, they've done those three simple things. So if you've been looking for what spiritual practices to use, that's a good place to start. I would recommend five minutes in the silence, working up to 15 or 20, maybe even 30. That intuitive thing, I didn't know about that, but that's, that's a new one for me that I just sort of discovered. At the end of my meditation, of my journaling, I just ask the question, what wants to happen today? And I listen. After I've had some time steeped in spiritual study and writing to get things all out of my mind on the page and sitting in the silence, it's amazing what will come in my intuition. It often is not what I thought it would be. But if I listen and if I follow it, it works every time. Yesterday, I, I tricked the, the attendees of our, of our meditation retreat just a little bit because we did practice meditation. I did some teaching on meditation. At the end of the day, we did a beautiful sound healing. Our own Mary Fair did a beautiful gong bath for us, and we walked the labyrinth. But I also had them break into groups of three or four and start, it's this exercise called, if you knew me, you would know. And it's a stream of consciousness thing where you just, you're kind of forced to just keep talking about it. If you knew me, you would know that I like dogs, Cindy Klein. If you knew me, you would know that I just spent a week with my goddaughter, my daughter, Micah, and I'm exhausted. If you knew me, you would know that we had some tough moments and yet we connected holding hands on the lazy river at that what is it, Typhoon, Texas. And what we've discovered in that is that Joanne's group was really loud. I'll just say that. <laughs> the laughter that you all generated. And Joanne shared, we discovered that we're the same. We're different, but there is a commonality in our experience. The trick was that I wanted to show people how easy it is to form spiritual community. How easy it is to drop the, the false faces and the armor and just be who you are, warts and all, as they say, and just be together. It's easy. The isolation that we're experiencing in our culture right now is deadly, and it's not necessary. So I tricked you again. I told you I was going to tell, give you a prosperity talk, and I'm giving you an invitation to community that here in this community, and if we're not your community, great. Go find a different one, one that fits your philosophy better, one that fits your sensibilities better, great. But if you're looking for a place to connect with some really human people who are committed to being a positive presence on the planet, who are committed to their own personal growth and spiritual unfolding, this may be the place for you to do this work not well, <laughs> to do it clumsily at first, but we do it together. It's incredible what happens. It's 11.59, Gary. I guess I should wrap this up. Let's pray, would you? Taking a moment now to feel the sense of possibility that is under our feet, whether our shoes are on the right feet or not. Welcome this, this sense that life is for us, that the ever-present energy of creative intelligence is all around, everywhere, right here, within me, around me, and it's always this way. And if I'm willing, I can tune my mind to the frequency of God. And this I do right now. I remember this deepest of truths, that there is nothing but the life of God, one presence, one power, one infinite source of all good, and it's here, and it's everywhere, and it's living, expressing itself in infinite, beautiful, creative expressions, and I am one, and everyone in the sound of my voice is one perfect expression of this perfect life. And knowing this truth, I speak my word now, 
knowing that we have never been and will never be and could never be separate from the flow of divine good. It is ours. And so we open our hearts, our minds, our souls, our bodies to receive the gift of life that is already given. Laying aside any thought of unworthiness, laying aside any thought of not deserving, laying aside any belief in scarcity, lack, or limitation, and feeling the abundance as easily and as near as drawing a breath. How beautifully we are supported in this life. How beautifully we are connected. I am filled with thanksgiving to know this, and I release this prayer now, don't, knowing that it's already accomplished. It already is, and so it is. Amen. I really love you all. It's not an act. I mean it. <laughs> and if no one else has told you today that they love you, I love you. Thank you. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.